Yeah, I mean, this is kind of like the planet that we showed at E3. I really like to kind of point out to people, I guess, that it's a real place, you know? It's a, it's a planet and it's kind of rotating around the sun and stuff. And that like, you can walk in any direction and you can walk for days and days and depending on the size of the planet, weeks and weeks, and you will eventually walk the whole way around the planet, you know, and come back to where you started. And I like that you're orbiting around the sun and stuff like that, and that you can look up in the sky and see that like there's actual features and things like that on the other planets that you can see and that they're real places too, that you're in like a solar system. You know, it's kind of cool doing this on the, the E3 build because a lot of people would have seen just the quick three minutes that we showed or whatever, but it wasn't some level that we built or something like that, even though I think it looks quite nice in places. You know, it's a procedurally generated world and like you can look down into the caves and things like you can see an exit down there and that like exit is, I can see it's in like the low lot. So it's like over a kilometer away, you know, and I can see down here, this huge cave network and I've never really been down there, but I know that when I've gone down there before, like just a little bit, it just goes on and on forever and you can get totally lost. I think people watching this would wonder why you're showing this area again. Like what's so special about demoing the game on this planet? Oh no, no, it's just, a uh, place that looks nice we don't have a particularly like big team so we just focus on making sure that we get the most out of our like our build that we bring together or whatever but we don't have to stay here I can just go into fly cam and I can like head out into space and like you can see it's real quick and we've got a whole bunch of planets here and stuff like that around us and I can just head down onto this other planet that we went down to are they normally that close together too not always. It was a really difficult thing to bring together a build to show on stage because we had really limited time, you know. <laughs> and I remember like Sony being a bit worried that we have this crazy ambitious game, but it's quite hard to boil down into a quick like sound bite of a trailer, if you know what I mean. So uh, it was important that we chose planets that were really close together. But we, they are closer together generally in the game than you would find in real life in our universe. And that's a conscious decision that we've made. I was sort of against it to begin with. Grant, our artist, kind of won out because he was saying like, show me a piece of sci-fi concept art that doesn't have crescent planet hanging on the horizon. And I was like, I kind of couldn't find that piece of <laughs> sci-fi concept. So it's like, fair enough. This is, you know, he was like, you said you wanted sci-fi book covers, that's sci-fi book covers. Um, so planets are a little closer than they would be. That's both for like an aesthetic reason, but also for like gameplay reasons. The reality is you want things to just be maybe a little bit closer together so that you, you have that freedom to go and visit planets. Mm -hmm. You want to spend most of your time doing that rather than traveling. But it's only a little bit. Actually, we have some planets that are like really, really far away, you know, and, and I like when that happens as well. It's just they tend to be a little bit closer on average. So yeah, the thing I was going to show you is kind of how these terrains are generated a little bit. Um, so like I can fly over this terrain and this is about the speed that you go at um, when you're flying in the ship kind of over the terrain. It's really fast, like surprisingly fast. You don't quite register it here because we're in like a debug cam and there's no camera shake or anything like that to give you any cues. Um, but what's happening as we go around is you can see this slight amount of like, it's not popping, but you can see the world fading in. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is like, it's actually being generated as I fly around. None of this exists on the like disc. None of it exists on the machine, like on your PS4 or whatever. None of it exists in the cloud. It's just generating from like a set of maths functions always generating the same way because because it's maths like any maths formula you take the same input and you put it into that math formula and you'll get the same output and for our game the formula like is really complex well a ser series of really simple formulas actually laid on top of each other to create something quite complex which is the universe so that's our formula for like the universe and for the planets and everything else and the input is your position 
So you give it any position in that universe and it will create everything that you see around you. That's the output. So for instance, like there's no real loading time. Um, all the time that you ever have, no matter where you go in the universe, is just the time it takes to generate the world around you. So I can actually like go much faster if I um, hold down the, the uh, left trigger. I'm just in a uh, in debug cam. I can go a lot faster and you can see the player will never be able to go this fast but you can see I start to outrun the world. right? Mm -hmm. um, but then if I stop you'll see the world generate around me. Um, and like that's to a real high level of detail so I can like zoom down right down to kind of a a single rock right? and then I can kind of like pop back up real quick and I can be out in space and kind of take a look around. Why haven't other developers done this before you? <laughs> uh, I don't know some people have done things a little bit like this um, you know no one's quite gone to this this taken it this far before um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I think one part of it is that like this is a kind of a next-gen idea. So mostly as developers, we actually just use more and more powerful machines um, to just make more, more and more pretty graphics, basically. So we, we actually have the same games generation after generation, the same kind of first-person shooters, the same things happen in them, but generally we anti-alias them more or have more specular maps or whatever and what we're doing is applying like an awful lot of the power of the hardware towards just generating the world around you rather than it being a pre-baked thing that you load up off disk um, and you need a pretty powerful machine to do that that I guess is what's quite next gen about it you know there's not that much that we're doing that like just hasn't been done I just don't think it's been brought together before you know um, there's things that I'm super proud of that like um, we uh, like and this is where it gets a bit mathsy probably but like we generate this world um, and when we do every every pixel and every like actual voxel that makes up the world has to generate without knowing anything about its neighbors right we just have a formula that runs and you give it an X, Y, and Z position and it will create what's at that voxel at that exact point in time kind of thing. Um, and that makes it really hard to do things that need to know about their surroundings. So um, actually generating hills and mountains isn't too bad, but generating them to have like erosion or to have rivers or to have caves and things like that, you kind of need to know about the overall structure. So when you generate a cave, it's really hard to generate it if you can't know whether or not you're underground or whatever. You. So um, that's been one of the most kind of complicated problems actually to solve. And I think that's where we've been a little bit clever, maybe. Do you think you guys have just invested so much mindshare into the idea of procedural generation that you're kind of pot committed at this point? That this is Hello <laughs> Games' specialty from here on out? Well, we didn't set out to make a procedural game we set out to make a kind of a sci-fi game and to make a game where you know you could visit new planets and things like that and that kind of necessitated this tech um, having said that like you know whilst the game idea did come first and the tech is second we're sort of a little bit in love with it you know like as in just procedural generation it would be really hard to go back to like just making worlds by hand making intricate levels and stuff I wouldn't say never but like one thing we found is it's so nice to be a small team but yet not be so constrained as like what we have been in the past maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's cool. So just to explain that a little bit further, as I fly around here, if we go into the tools, you can see this, which is actually the LOD, which is like level of detail, and that's being generated around us, right? And that's like the, the highest level of detail that's right around us and you can see that that's got a series of like bars that's changing colors right there little regions that are changing colors all around us and that is those regions and those voxels kind of going from 
nothing to becoming voxels generated by the mats, then to becoming polygonized and having things like the grass that's gonna live on them and the trees and the creatures generated and, and those kind of spawned and stuff like that. So it changes colors as you go through. But like, as I go, uh, you can see that that's happening like incredibly quickly. And that's sort of only possible with like these crazy multi-core next-gen machines kind of thing and what's really exciting is like in future this can be more detailed and more interesting and that wouldn't require that much more work from us because the machine would be getting more powerful and we would be able to do more to what extent do you see procedural generation as the future of gaming do you think it's taking over a majority in the future no i think we always um like we always like will want real artistic input and stuff like that like that's super important and like our art team i think the game looks nice and that's because of our art team rather than because of maths or anything like that but i think right now like you guys visit loads of different studios and you see teams of hundreds and hundreds and you think how are all these what are all these people doing generally it's art generally if you have 800 people on assassin's creed an awful lot of those people will be making art. And you can see it as you walk around their worlds, they're incredible. But that's a real constraint. If you need 800 people to make a game, then you sort of can't do anything too crazy. You sort of need to say to them, it needs to be a bit like the last Assassin's Creed, but, you know, set in a different like time or something like that. So I think what it would be cool is if procedural generation it didn't like take over or anything like that but it helped solve some of those problems so maybe you're a little bit less constrained do you feel like you've kind of have become or are becoming the evangelist for procedural generation <laughs> in the industry well we'll see if the game turns out good and then people can make their minds up <laughs> so these are tools like we wrote our own engine um you know a lot of Indie devs generally use like Unreal or use Unity or whatever. That wasn't really suitable for us. We wrote our own engine for Joe Danger. I've always written engines, so we sort of didn't think about it that much. We're like, but the procedural nature of things meant that we sort of had to do it ourselves. And so this is a set of tools. This is like, I should say that really clearly. You will never see these like playing the game. This is awful and horrible and debug and I shouldn't be showing it in front of anyone but it helps to explain how the game is made so yeah if i move real quick you can see that we can start out running that that generation a little bit um, and then as soon as i slow down it starts to come in and there's a whole bunch of lots and this one's like the low level and it's got like little rocks and things like that on it you know and then this will be the next level up and the next level after that and that goes kind of right down to like the planet level so even when you're playing the game normally and you're walking around the planet, that planet's been generated to the entire size of the planet, just at a low level of detail. So when you're stood on a mountain, you can stand on a really tall mountain and you'll be able to see like the curvature of the planet and be able to see effectively forever kind of thing. And if I like fly out into space, you'll see that those lods get thrown away. It's sort of a shame, all that computation, we just throw it away. And then as soon as I fly back down, it will all be regenerated again. What sort of reaction from developers have you gotten towards this tech? I don't know. We haven't shown other developers this stuff that much. I've had a few people who were working on like Star Wars games and things like that and Star Trek games who were trying to build huge expanses of alien planets by hand with hundreds of people saying how it's quite difficult to see. <laughs> you know, because it, you sort of think, oh, I just saw an entire alien world generated in like 15 seconds. <laughs> like, so that's the core of it. Why didn't they try it first? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I guess, like I said, next gen, maybe we're really clever or something, you know. <laughs> Do you think that's also part of the question? Do you think you guys are just incredibly talented programmers all in one place. <laughs> I know it's tough to say yes, but... No, no, I, I don't. I think I would say uh, actually we're quite uh, like stupid. And that's the reason that we've done this is I think like if we were to sat down, have sat down and thought it through, it would have seemed 
impossible and not a very good way to make a game but we just started doing it you know I just started writing tech and then it sort of worked and then you find yourself just I describe it as like being on a, a train and you start like shoveling coal into that train and it moves faster and faster and faster the more you put in and so now we're like at breakneck speed and we you know there's no escaping that train basically if we jump off we'll be killed kind of thing <laughs> it's like this runaway train now we're doing it so th that's actually true that you you hit problems and you think oh my god we'll never be able to solve this and then you sort of think well we have to so you, you do <laughs> you know. does it feel that much more challenging than previous games you've worked on uh yeah definitely this is the hardest thing i've ever done yeah without a doubt so you guys are dumb enough to try this and smart enough to pull it off yeah I, well we'll see we'll see when it comes out okay. <laughs> so far so the idea is that we like generate the the planets um in particular the planet kind of terrain and stuff um through a set of maths functions right um, and that defines every like hill and rock and every you know river and everything like that that you see and overhang and what have you and so like this big 3d kind of maths function that runs um and the easiest way to explain it, I think, is to say, if you imagine a really like simple maths function, so if you imagine a sine wave, right, um, that just kind of goes up and down, up and down, just like sine. And like if you were to pick any point along that uh, sine wave, you would know what height above or below the kind of origin line that should be right and sine wave kind of looks a little bit like mountains it just goes up and down and we do okay much more complicated formulas than that but effectively um you can have a sine wave can go on forever and you know you don't have to actually store any information about it kind of thing so you just run it for a given x value you can always have the y value type of thing right and it will always come out the same so if we had a planet that was just sine waves or whatever and that was just generated from that then you can imagine how two people could go to the same planet and uh, find exactly the same thing kind of thing so every planet is a distorted sine wave to some effect no no it's way it's actually based on noise which is properly random. It's just that the computer boots up and, and its random functions always return the same values for the same place. But sign is predictable by me through like intuition. The game, because it's based on noise, is like unpredictable to me by intuition if you see what I mean. And it never repeats, whereas a sine wave will always repeat. So it's not just a distorted sine wave or anything like that, but it is a it is a math formula. I guess that's the similarity type of thing. But if I just change this, I can actually feed in any math formula and it's quite fun. I use this for like debugging purposes and stuff like that. I've got a series of different noise types that I can feed in there when I'm trying to find little bugs and things. So I can take this planet and I can like change those values and then I can just click regenerate. Then you can see that we have the planet of like sine waves, like the most boring maths planet in the world, right? But like you, you get an idea of how that's possible and I can kind of like fly around these. This would be a really boring planet and will never exist in the game. It might be really nice if you wanted to like go skiing or something like mm. that, you know. So the core of it is early on in this project, you made the seed for the galaxy and now you're just tweaking that seed. But the layout's the same. You're not regenerating the seed every single time with a different starting point. No, it's it's what I was explaining before about it not just being sine waves, mm -hmm. like it not just being a predictable maths function. It's uh, what you'd call in maths terms like chaotic. So changes have massive implications. So as we change things, and this happens <laughs> like to hilarious effect when we were trying to make, when we we're trying to bring together a build to show off. So we're trying to do something for E3 and you're like, oh, I like it the way like those deer come over that hill or whatever. And then Dave changes something that you would 
expect to be totally unrelated, something very small about ships or something. And suddenly the whole world has changed and that hill no longer exists and those deer no longer exist, you know. And so you have these like huge implications to tiny changes, basically. So as you develop the game and you want to add more variety to the game, you just have to make sure it's the most balanced, careful additions possible. Uh, no, we're pretty gung-ho um, <laughs> because nobody knows what's changing, so nobody misses it, you know. In terms of development, this is a weird thing to explain, but like every, every person downstairs has a different universe on their machine, you know. Um, and when the game comes out, then we'll be locked on like one universe type of thing. And we have a main server, which is what people check into. And that's, that's the official universe. And when I want to go and take a build to uh, BGX or E3, then we grab that version. But until then, it's, it's pretty much in flux and a little bit crazy. Gotcha. Which is why sometimes it can be extremely challenging to bring together builds and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> when you create like an MMO, character for the first time you have your set of sliders and you move them all and you use that to create your version of the character well we sort of have that for everything in the game so every tree rock piece of grass creature whatever um, so the artist will build something like this actually it won't be this one you know they'll build something that's just a prototype and they model it out in a thing called zbrush and you're basically just making things out of clay so they don't so much model in in polys and things like that and they don't do texturing and things like that so much and then they bring it into game and they can click a button and it will show them hundreds of variants and they can click it again it'll show them hundreds more and this will be just one creature type and there will be hundreds of creature types in the game but each one of them will have, you know, practically infinite number of variations. And it's not just creatures, it's, it's everything. And even for a creature, what you don't get across when you see one is that they're different scales and that actually changes their behaviors. So if you look at a lizard, that a lizard can be incredibly small and like not scary at all, but it also can be dinosaur size and we change the proportions and everything like that of the bodies as we go through so their rigs change so something like a giraffe and a horse are actually the same species in our game kind of thing are you guys as into dinosaurs as the public believes you are right now just with the <laughs> amount that they've been in the demos like are dinosaurs going to play that large of a game or is it no, just a coincidence that that's that... a coincidence we think they're cool for sure but we've tried not to show super alien creatures because we think people they can find their head it's hard to wrap their heads around that it's a really surprising thing but if you show underwater but you show something that is swimming past but doesn't look like a fish and doesn't behave like a fish then people actually find it hard to know that you're underwater anymore and it can make for like a confusing demo once people are in the game they will see stuff like that and i think they'll accept it more but at the moment, we didn't want to show things that couldn't exist on Earth or that they don't have so many kind of like touch points for. But we also didn't want to just show things that look like lions and tigers and stuff like that. So we thought that kind of reptilian and, and prehistoric uh, stuff looked best, at, you know, and got across what was possible within this generation without, you know, blowing people's minds too much. So they're going to be freakier and more abstract in the final game. Yeah, that's possible. And that will happen actually more and more towards the center of the galaxy. But it's not just the creatures. It's things like ships and stuff as well. This is kind of the ship that we've showed off before. Uh, it's just a fighter, but you can view variants of it. And there's an infinite number of variations of that ship, which is a cool thing for players. Each one of them is pilotable. Each one of them will handle slightly differently when you have a ship it feels a little bit like it's your own you know because it is pretty unique and you're not gonna see 10 other people with the same ship but even with the creatures something that's fun for me is people generally when they think of creatures they only think of like four-legged creatures or whatever or land creatures i like that you know even our insects and like you sometimes see butterflies and things like that they're procedurally generated you know and you get little 
creatures running about and that's just all color for me like birds and stuff in the air you get little tiny ones and huge big ones and even like underwater so this is like a fish type and he's just kind of prototyped at the moment but <laughs> he's got a he's got a cool smile as well <laughs> but even those you know there's something uniquely fun about going underwater sometimes going into like an underwater cave and then just seeing something that you've never seen before pop out at you or knowing that that might happen is quite a cool thing. You would look at these and think, right, these are fish and variants of fish, but in an alien landscape, you don't really know that actually. You know, one of those can go flying past and that's fine, I think. Like we don't necessarily put those constraints on how things will be. You tweeted a while ago that you can't imagine anything scarier than coding live. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> Is this close to coding live for you, showing these tools? Yes, I kind of think this stuff is like, you know, not for public consumption, basically. I like things to look nice and be finished and stuff, and I can't bear not to see that generally, you know. <laughs> um, whether, like, you know, there's certain things that you, um, like, you know, you don't have control over and stuff, but generally I'm kind of very close to the screen when I'm playing the game kind of thing. I think it kind of works as an inspirational piece for up-and-coming developers, though, to see a massive project like this when it's only halfway finished? Um, I think it might be nice for people to see, like, small teams doing stuff, you know? Like, I think Notch is a big inspiration to people, and, like, he should be, you know? Like, there's something nice. If you're, like, at home and you're thinking of getting into developing, it's kind of daunting to see like like the Watch Dogs team or the Assassin's Creed team or whatever. I think that's like, that's difficult to kind of think, oh, there's 800 people making that game. Where would I fit into that? It's quite nice to think, oh, you can actually still do something yourself or with a few friends or whatever. Um, I always think that's good. Like I definitely, that was a big thing for me growing up you know, was like actually id were huge for me when I was thinking of getting into games, just thinking they seemed like a small team and they seemed to be having a lot of fun and seemed to like, you know, be doing amazing things. Um, and that was a really big deal for me. And you got that sense just from the games themselves? I think the personality did come through in the games. Like, you know, I, but I read a lot about them at the time, you know, um, and like now we have like very kind of whitewashed, often quite boring developer diaries and stuff, you know, that just stay on message and just like pump out like a PR message or whatever. But then when those guys used to talk about the games or you would read like change logs and stuff like that, even they had like a lot of personality and stuff, you know, and that was really nice because you thought they're normal human beings. So maybe I can, I'm a normal human being, <laughs> maybe I can do something. Although I did always think Carmack was like not normal and human, um, like in that he was amazing. So here's a weird question. With so much time spent thinking about the numbers behind the galaxy mm. and the universe, has it changed your perception of real world physics and our universe at all? Um, without, without sounding too pretentious, I think it does. You look up at like the, the night sky and you typically see a few thousand stars or whatever. And that seems like an awful lot, you know, and it kind of makes you feel a little bit small. But what you don't realize is that when you're looking up, there are galaxies worth of stars, hundreds of millions of billions of stars over your head, you know, and if you could see that, you would, I don't even know. I, I, I think you probably either couldn't worry about anything ever again, um, because you would just be, you would just think, what is the point, you know, nothing's a big deal, or you just kind of dismay and think, oh, what is the point in anything? <laughs> How small am I and insignificant? Um, but like, you don't see that many stars and you don't have a sense of how small you are often. Um, and like a weird thing, like doing stuff like us making the, the um, even the galactic map and working on that, it sounds cheesy, but there are moments that I've thought, 
wow, because it's like a visual representation of, of to some degree, how big our own galaxy is. And it's kind of incredible, you know, to, you get that from like watching loads of shows like Cosmos and stuff like that. Um, but it, it's weird to see it in a game and to kind of feel that way. Often in games, games feel surprisingly constrained, you know, so like, and we're used to that. We're used to walking up to doors and them not opening and things like that. And actually like say Mass Effect, we're used to viewing a whole galaxy map and there being like three things selectable or whatever. Um, and it's like when you take those constraints off, it's sort of a little bit daunting, <laughs> you know, You're like where do I even start, you know. Have you ever thought of showing this game to physicists? Um, we've had like a few like chemists and physicists and stuff get in contact, just being super excited about it, you know. Um, and like we haven't had time we've had like people like exobiologists and stuff like that get in contact and and they'll often send like super interesting links and things like that 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 have informed the game a little bit um but in general the really nice thing that they've said is like they'd like to use it when the game comes out like as a tool just to show people just to demonstrate certain things that mm -hmm. that kind of make something that might be considered a little bit boring, like a little bit more interesting or whatever, just when you actually are able to walk around somewhere alien, it's a bit more interesting than just talking about, you know, a certain star cluster mm -hmm. or something like that. Or even just getting across that idea that a relatively simple equation can create an entire galaxy. Yeah, yeah. I think there's there's like a series of things that are you know, for me, actually, like, it's made things... I never liked geography when I was going to school. Um, you know, and we would do about, like, tectonic plates and erosion and things like that. It's made that super interesting for me. <laughs> Just, like, how, how shapes form. You know, yeah. that's a big part of what we do. Like, how canyons and rivers and caves and things, we have to think about that kind of stuff. Because we can't just build them. So you have to become a professor after this project, then, right? <laughs> the only road. <laughs> Some form of profession. <laughs> no. uh, like I said, we're, we've only done this because we're stupid enough to do it. So <laughs> we can get our PhD in that. <laughs> like blatant stupidity. I know you're a long ways off and you're kind of knee deep in the trenches here, but do you have any idea what you'd like to do next? I mean, are you sick of sci fi at this point? Oh, no, I won't. Like, I'll never. I, I would. That would be the worst thing if this game burnt me out from like sci-fi. I'll never have that, I don't think. I made burnout for years and like I was never that into cars. I remember lying in the interview being like, oh, I love cars, I don't love cars. <laughs> <laughs> but I love sci-fi, I don't think that's going away. Um, and it's made me, if anything, like more into it. But I think, you know, as to what we do next, I'd really like to see us I like the game to be popular and that we'd get to work on it more even after it comes out. Mm -hmm. You know, that would be that would be nice. That's how I feel at the moment, at least. And you've only made one galaxy. You still have to make the universe, right? Yeah, exactly. Cool. Anything else on the procedurally generated front that you want to cover or touch on that we haven't... Um, no, I think that's cool. Hopefully it's like, yeah, I know it's been really rambly and no, like I'm not... Perfect. It's, no, no, it's, it's a hard thing to like talk about. I'm very aware that it's, you know, geeky, techy stuff and it's not really the game, you know what I mean?